Let's move on to golfer's elbow. Now, lateral epicondylitis is very common, and if you understand lateral epicondylitis, you will definitely understand golfer's elbow. It's extremely similar. It's a different muscle group. It's the same type of principle of etiology. Which of the following provocative tests would most likely be positive in a patient with medial epicondylitis? Resisted forearm pronation and wrist flexion with a clenched fist? Sounds very good because it's the opposite side of the elbow with the muscle group involved with pronation and wrist flexion. Resisted forearm supination and wrist extension? Well, wrist extension is the extensor muscles on the lateral epicondyle. Dynamic valgus stress test, that's for a ulnar collateral ligament tear, milking maneuver is ulnar collateral ligament injury, and the pinch grip test not consistent with the forearm muscles on the medial epicondyle. So we got this right, 85%. So resisted forearm pronation and flexion of a clenched wrist. So it's overuse of that flexor pronator mass. It's less common than lateral epicondylitis. It's most commonly the dominant arm. Makes sense. It's going to be your dominant arm. Here's the risk. Anything that's repetitive, that is the key concept. These are repetitive, call them overuse activities. And so the golfer is subject to it. People who do things like play racket sports, even play tennis, certain aspects of work such as uh, manual labor could be involved. Jobs involving lifting forceful grip as an example. The pathophysiology, I will go through this uh, and essentially say it is the same as lateral epicondylitis, repetitive forceful activities, repetitive activities called micro tears. The micro tears don't heal properly and you get fibrous tissue that develops. Here's the important associated conditions. Just like the lateral side, we will see associated conditions on the medial side. And on the medial side, we have the ulnar nerve, so you can have ulnar neuropathy. We have the ulnar collateral ligament, so you can have ulnar collateral ligament injuries, especially in the throwing athlete. And so associated conditions occur commonly. And really, this is a test of anatomy. If you understand the medial aspect of the elbow anatomy, you know that the local anatomy can also be involved with some pathology. Common flexor tendon is a few centimeters long. It attaches onto the medial epicondyle. It runs parallel to the MCL, so it's very well uh, in close anatomic proximity to the MCL. And the ulnar head of the pronator teres becomes confluent with the hyperplastic part of the anterior medial capsule. So in some areas, the flexor mass is intimate or attached with the capsule. Therefore, injuries occur in combination together. And the flexor pronator mass here, you can see the muscles that are listed. I pay a lot of attention to the palmaris longus because not every patient has that. And the palmaris longus we use for grafts. The flexor culpionaris we'll hear about, that's very important to creating valgus stability dynamically. Important muscles to know. Here's the presentation. It can include acute traumatic blow causing an avulsion. This is not classic epicondylitis. It's in the genre of the medial forearm muscles. We could call it a flexor pronator injury, a flexor pronator strain, or a flexor pronator avulsion, but it has a very sim similar examination. If there's tenderness, uh, exactly as medial epicondylitis, just distal and anterior to the medial epicondyle, there can be soft tissue swelling, and there is classic resisted pain with forearm pronation and resisted flexion. In fact, I like that they asked this as a question because this is my go-to exam in the office. This isn't just for testing. This is what I do in the office on a very regular basis. So associated conditions are important to examine for. Valgus instability, we're going to talk more about that in the overhead athlete. The go-to exam for that is a valgus stress test. A moving valgus stress test is the most sensitive and specific. That's going to be a test question potentially. Ulnar neuritis. There's ways to examine for that. We're going to see that in the next few slides. And the elbow flexion test that we'll see in the next few slides can also be consistent with a clinical diagnosis of ulnar neuritis. X-rays, usually unremarkable, just like the lateral side may have calcification. Ultrasound can be used lateral side and medial side. They can have hypoechoic areas. And so ultrasound is getting more popular. It's worth knowing. I use ultrasound in the office as an example, and I look for... Uh, signal changes both on the medial and lateral side of the elbow. 
And here's the MRI scan, not necessary for the diagnosis, but can help exclude, especially in a high-level athlete, other injuries such as a UCL tear. But here's an example. This is the flexor pronator attachment to the epicondyle, and you see that signal change right where the arrow is, indicating the medial epicondylitis, and that's where the tenderness will be on exam, and that's the muscle group you test for weakness. Non-operative treatment, of course, is the first-line treatment. If you know that for the lateral side, you know it for the medial side. And you can see that there are some similar treatment strategies with bracing, cortisone injections. You have to be very careful, though. Cortisone injections in this area, there's nerves that need to be considered and should be done in a very safe fashion. So the complications of a cortisone injection include skin depigmentation and also subcutaneous atrophy. If you have not seen this, it's very dramatic, especially in a young, thin patient, such as a young female. The thinning in the skin pigmentation can be very concerning to them. It can also cause tendon weakening and the ulnar nerve, especially if it's subluxing, if it's not located in the cubital tunnel, can be injured by an injection. I have seen this complication myself. So it does happen. The treatment here is debridement after failure of non-operative treatment. But here in blue, open. Medial epicondylitis, when it needs surgery, is treated open. The lateral side can be treated with arthroscopy. It's an important distinction between medial and lateral. And the reason is because the nerve anatomy on the medial side of the elbow does not lend itself to doing arthroscopic techniques. It's just too high risk, and your ability to get to the pathology is not the same as on the lateral side with arthroscopic instruments. So this, in fact, is a case of mine. This is an open debridement. You open up the flexor mass, create a healing response on the bone, and then you repair the flexor mass, and you debride all of that tendonotic tissue, that fibroblastic tissue, and if necessary, you can perform a cubital tunnel release or uh, transposition. Just like the lateral side, you can take care of any neuritis or neuropathy associated conditions. So rehabilitation is uh, standard. It's regain motion and strength while protecting the repair. The complications. Complications are favorite test questions. Medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve neuropathy. So the cutaneous nerves can be cut, and afterwards they can get a neuropathy from that. It's uh, very helpful to protect those nerves during surgery to the medial aspect of the elbow. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.